Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about peer-to-peer -peer OS and Flatpak updates, which is something that we've been working on at Endless um, over the last year and a bit. Um, so I'll define some terminology first, um, because these terms are a bit vague sometimes. Um, Flatpak, uh, you've probably all heard of. It's a Linux, Linux application sandboxing and distribution framework. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we just need to know that it's basically something that uses OS tree, which provides things that users care about. Um, we don't need to do any more details about how Flatpak works. Um, the OS in this case is Endless OS, which is a Debian-based operating system. Um, again, you don't need to know any more details about it, apart from the fact that it's based on OS tree. Um, OS tree is very briefly Git for operating system file trees, um, but I'll go into more details about what that means on the next slide. Um, and peer-to-peer -peer updates, we care about updating from other computers on the local network and from a USB stick that's been pre-prepared by someone else with updates for you. Um, so the overall goal is to be able to distribute uh, system updates and distribute new versions and new and different applications to other people without them having to download them over the internet. So OS tree, um, which is kind of the core of how this is all done, um, and the core of how Endless OS is implemented, and the core of how Flatpak is implemented, um, it's, yeah, it's kind of like Git. It's a content addressed file system where you dump files in, they are uh, hashed by their content um, and stores the path based on that. Um, so each of them has a checksum. Um, each object can be a file, it can be a directory tree that contains a hierarchy of files, or it can be a comment object which contains some combination of files and directory trees. Um, it's got refs, which are basically human readable names which point to a comment, just like a git branch does. Um, and they can change over time, so you can point them from an old comment to a new comment to a newer comment. Uh, it's got remotes, just like Git remotes. They are a little configuration saying, here's some repository on the internet somewhere which you can download updated refs from. Um, each remote has a name which you choose locally. Um, by convention, it's always the same, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and as I said before, Flatpak is based on OS tree. So in, in the Flatpak world, you've got apps. Each app is a ref in OS tree terminology. Um, and when you deploy an app, that is a comet from OS tree with a load of files that contain whatever the app needs. Um, it's binary, it's icon, whatever. So how do we add peer-to-peer -peer support? Um, what we have to begin with with OS tree are these refs. These refs are unique per repository. So just like a Git branch, you've got a master branch for each Git repository you care about. Um, but each repository has a master branch. So if you want to update your master branch, you need to know what repository you're caring about. Um, same if you have um, a ref in OS tree and you want to update it, you need to know what ref that it actually is. So if, if I have um, an app that I've produced locally called gedit, and there's also a gedit produced um, by the GA de developers and published separately, they're going to have probably the same ref name, but they probably refer to different content. So what you need is a global namespace which disambiguates those and says that the GEDIT over here that I've produced locally is mine, and the GEDIT over there is theirs, and those should be considered as separate things. So we need a global namespace for refs. How do we do that? We added something called collection IDs. Um, so these are basically a globally unique version of the remote name. So you can uniquely identify each repository and clones of it mirrored around the world um, with a collection ID. Um, so if Jedit were to be published by the Jedit developers in their repository, they would set a collection ID for that repository. If that were to be mirrored by GNOME, they would copy the same collection ID so that all the refs from either are considered to be equal. Um, and then if I were to publish my own gedit, I would choose a different collection ID because I'm publishing something which is not necessarily the same as what they're doing. So if you take a collection ID and a ref and consider those as a tuple, that becomes globally unique and you can use those to look up and query for updates for the refs you want um, wherever. Vivek, you've got a question. 
I can repeat it. Is there a convention or some enforcement for making people not collide with the names of their collection IDs? Uh, there's no enforcement, although if someone were to choose a collection ID that had already been chosen and it started to collide with things, then errors would appear everywhere. Um, there is a convention to use reverse domain names, um, same as most other things, um, but this is documented. Um, yeah, any other questions so far? Cool. Um, yeah, so to summarize, collection IDs are like a name for a remote, but configured globally rather than locally. Yeah. Um, does this mean that you could prepare a malicious version of one app, put it on a USB stick, walk over to somebody else's endless OS computer, then essentially update the app with the malicious version? You would have to have the GPG key from the original. Right, office. so there is a measure of enforcement. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll come on to that in a second, but I'm very perceptive. Um, so yes, summary files are the other half of the problem. Um, OS tree has, each repository has a summary file, and that contains, amongst other things, um, a map of refs to comment checksums. Um, so it just gives like a complete list of what the repository contains and the comments for each of those refs. Um, and it contains some other metadata, like the repository description and, um, yeah, its name, localized name. Um, and the summary file is signed by the same key uh, for the entire repository, so you know the summary is uh, authentic for that repository, so that you can't, like, have a man in the middle interject a summary that contains uh, incorrect data or malicious data uh, as you download over HTTP, which you can do for OS3. Um, so it's traditionally signed as one big blob of stuff, um, and it lists the refs. If I am on a local area network, and I've got some refs from this repository over here, and some refs from this repository over here, and maybe some from my operating system vendor over here, uh, and I've installed all of those, and I want to expose my local OS tree repository onto the network, I've basically got things from three different summary files, and I need to combine those into one. I can't do that if I've got one signature for the entire file, because A, I can't reproduce any of the signatures from any of the upstream vendors, and B, I can't sign with three keys somehow for different bits of content. Um, so the solution there is to, uh, yeah, that's, that's the problem. The solution is to drop the signatures. Um, that reduces security, you say. Um, so we reintroduce security by implementing it a different way, splitting the ref mapping up and flipping around how the security is done. Um, so instead of having a summary file which binds a ref, which is the name, to a comet checksum, you have a ref binding which is in the comet which binds the ref name to that comet. Um, so it's kind of backwards rather than forwards. Um, and you can do this because each comment in OS3 has some metadata, um, sort of saying its date and the author and maybe a, a comment message, um, just like Git comments do. Um, and this metadata is always signed by the person who built the repository. Um, so if you put some extra metadata in there that says this comment should be on this ref and maybe also this ref and this ref, um, and then you sign the whole lot, you can always check whether a comment that you've downloaded and looked at is actually meant to be on the ref that you thought you downloaded it from, which means that when you get rid of the signature on the summary file, um, although the summary file isn't trusted, you can then verify from everything that you pull back from it. So now the groundwork is in place. Um, those are the two big problems that were in, in the way of doing peer-to-peer -peer updates. We can do them. Um, so with USB updates, we essentially take an OS tree repository and put it in a well-known location on a USB stick. Um, and with the LAN updates, we essentially just expose an OS tree repository on the local network with a web server. With the LAN stuff, how do you actually find the updates on your local network without going to every machine and saying, like, what refs do you have? Can I have all of them? Are they up to date? Because that would 
result in a lot of unnecessary traffic. Um, so like with a, a LAN of 30 machines, say, in a small business or a, a school or whatever, um, each of them have 100 refs, like a couple of your operating system, various apps that you've installed. Um, many of them will be at different versions. How do you actually find which refs that you, you want and which are up to date and which machine has the latest update that everyone else can pull from? The solution is to take a Bloom filter of the refs on each OS tree and put it in a DNS SD record with the Vahi. Um, and then when you're updating from that peer, you will check whether the ref you want is in their Bloom filter. If it isn't, you don't care about it anymore. If it potentially is, um, because Bloom filters aren't entirely deterministic, you download the summary file from that peer and you check to see if it does actually contain the ref you want or whether it was a false match. Um, and if it does contain the ref you want, you then download uh, that comet, check the GPG signatures are all correct and match the ref, um, and then download the rest of the comets and update from them. Um, the code for all of this uh, is being done completely upstream in libos and in Flatpak. Um, and there are some components in our updater for Endless OS, the OS updater, which is also free software. Um, and it's already been supported in various upstream repositories um, where the collection IDs have been added to their configuration. Um, so FlatHub, for example, has a collection ID set. So you can already use FlatHub apps with peer-to-peer -peer updates um, if the tooling you're using supports it. I mean, that's still all being shipped out to distributions and um, probably hasn't been enabled in many places yet, but the pieces are in place. Um, the components that we have in the Endless OS updater, um, they're the bits that if you wanted to implement this for yourself, for your own distribution or um, platform, they're the bits you'd have to replicate or adapt. Um, they're, they're not like shipped by default by Flatpak. Um, so we've got a web server and a DNS SD record generator for the LAN sharing, um, which basically takes your local OS tree repository, exposes it over the network, and also updates an Avahi list of DNS SD records and generates the Bloom filter from the refs that you have. Um, and various bits of plumbing for that to integrate it with systemd and uh, do socket activation and stuff. This has been worked on by quite a few people. Um, at Endless, we've got Matthew, Rob, Dan, uh, Kreshmir, and me, and then lots of help and review and uh, feedback from Colin and Alex at OS Dream Flatpak, um, and also a lot of reviews and merge testing done by the RH Atomic bot. And that's it. Um, we're hiring, so if anyone wants to talk to me about that, please do. Uh, we're looking for desktop engineer and tooling engineers. Um, but the code is all there. And uh, has anybody got any questions? I feel that was like a, a lightning approach to it, um, so I can expand in detail uh, on anything. Yeah. Um, how does this DNS SD record compare to distributed hash tables? To what, sorry? Distributed hash tables. Um, I think distributed hash tables took up a lot more space and they weren't as easy to implement. Um, but yeah, I can't remember the details now. Um, we wanted the Bloom filters to take up. There were various restrictions on what we knew could be supported by different routers um, as they forward DNS SD packets. Um, some of the larger DNS SD packets just get dropped. So we wanted the Bloom filter to be really small. Um, distributed hash tables, I think, come out a bit bigger. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's been a while since I actually looked at that. Bloom filters certainly do what we want. Um, they allow you to have more than enough refs in your local repository that you're advertising, sort of several thousand, if I remember correctly, before the probability of collisions becomes too high to make it worthwhile. Um, and they do mean that you can massively cut down the amount of requests you have to make, like unicast from you to the computer you think has a ref, 
um, uh, by using the bloom filters to, to cull the ones that definitely don't have the refs you want. Um, does that answer in a bit more detail? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Alex, back there. So, yeah. I was promised a color emoji in the slides. Mm, you were promised an emoji. You got two emojis. Well, it was black. It's a color-ish. A color emoji would have detracted from the color scheme of the slides, I think. So, sorry. Uh, so, what about uh, WAN updates? Uh, oh, what, sorry? Why just restrict it to LAN updates and not do updates over the entire internet? I guess by using DNS SD, you sort of restrict yourself technically, but uh, uh, is there a, uh, a reason for not thinking about uh, WAN updates? Um, I mean, the original use case we had for supporting LAN updates is because endless OS is something that we want to run on computers which have restricted internet access, and particularly the use case we were caring about was schools, where um, the teacher's machine will have an internet connection, and then there'll be loads of student machines that don't, and they can only connect to the teacher's machine. Um, I can't immediately see there being an advantage in doing updates over a wider network, um, because the cost of communication between all the peers would start to get very complicated and also didn't want to go into like writing an entire distributed hash table file system that's not my thing um, this does the job for um, the use case that we cared about um, there's nothing stopping people from writing one in future so the underlying APIs in OS tree that allow uh, my computer to say, I want this ref and this ref and this ref, find updates for them. Um, they will in parallel look on the internet, on the local network, and on any USB sticks that are plugged in. So you can always write an extra provider which would, I don't know, look on BitTorrent or something, um, or some other custom protocol, um, as long as it can do um, implement. There's a couple of virtual functions, basically. Um, but it can do all of these things in parallel, um, and it will take whichever updates appear first and look likely um, for some moderately well-defined metric of what likely means. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, the, it's a possibility in future if you want. Any other questions? <coughs> So thank you, Philip, and give him a round of applause. Thanks.